In April of 2018, it was announced that Gillian Flynn, the author of Gone Girl and Sharp Objects, would be helming a new Amazon Prime series called Utopia. And I was excited about this not only because I think Flynn is a pretty great writer, but because what most viewers who will be exposed to this show will probably not be aware of is that Utopia is actually a remake of a British series of the same name. A series that just happens to be one of my favourite TV shows of all time. Unfortunately, Utopia was tragically cut short after two seasons, but with this new remake coming sometime next year, I thought it would be the perfect time to get some new viewers interested in the show and hopefully ruin a few weeks of your lives when you inevitably become depressed upon realising that the original series will never be completed. For those of you who haven't seen the show and aren't entirely sold on it just based on my recommendation alone, I've decided to make this first video an in-depth explanation of why the first episode makes for such a great introduction to the story. So if you don't mind having the first episode spoiled for you, watch this first part, then go watch the rest of the show, and then come back for the second part, where I'll be covering the rest of the series with a more general overview of the themes and characters, not a detailed analysis of each episode scene by scene like this one. So let's jump straight into it. The show opens with what is essentially a clue to the central conspiracy of the story. We see beautiful shots of fields, shots that will be littered throughout the entire show, seeing as overpopulation and food shortages are very important to the central themes of the series, as is established by what we hear on the radio. The government's coming under increasing pressure to take urgent action to reduce the soaring cost of food. The latest food price index indicates that many food commodities on international markets have doubled in value in the last six months, reflected by rocketing prices. In so this already plants a seed, of which we don't yet understand the relevancy, but will become extremely important later on. From this, we jump into the opening scene of the show that perfectly sets up everything we need to know. It basically establishes three things, aesthetic, tone, and premise. The aesthetic is conveyed through the vibrant audio-visual presentation. The tone follows from that aesthetic and is presented as being extremely violent, yet somehow upbeat, and the premise is established through the reasons for this violence. These two hitmen are looking for a comic manuscript and a person named Jessica Hyde. Through their willingness to murder people, and even children, in order to cover up their tracks, we understand the importance of their mission, and the lengths they are willing to go to in order to accomplish it. And we end the scene with the exterior of the comic book store. The name of the store, Doomsday Comics, placed above the title card of the show, creating a juxtaposition that serves as perfect foreshadowing for later events. And all of this information is conveyed in the very first sequence of the episode. Don't put the gas away yet. And now that the audience is hooked, we meet our protagonists. First up is Becky. It's a comic. No, it's a graphic novel. It's called The Utopia Experiments. It's about a scientist who makes a deal with the devil for knowledge. We immediately understand that she's in some way connected to what we saw in the opening sequence because of the comic book she's talking about, and we also get a clear picture of her temperament. His name was Mark Dane. He was a delusional, paranoid schizophrenic. He spent two years in a mental institution called Shenley, where he wrote this and then killed himself, which adds to the conspiracy. The assassination of Indira Gandhi... Conspiracy's Gan not really very now. Are you saying that you think this is real? Because that's a... Bit... I'm... Can I actually say what I want to say? Or no you just one gonna... is attacking you, Becky. And after hearing what happened to her father, then seeing her take some pills, we can infer why she's so ill-tempered. Up until May, you were on course to be a doctor, so why the sudden change? My father died. My father had a degenerative illness called Deal Syndrome, where his entire body shut down. So again, we're clued into three important details. Personality type, backstory, and relation to the main plot. Next up is Ian. Martin, these are the RDS sheets. Yeah, I'm doing that. I'm just trying to... Well, you're not. You're messing about on forums. I'm not messing around on forums. In this scene, we get some very clever exposition from Ian's boss, who says... Yeah, well, I've got a joke for you. You're 28 years old, and you still live at home with your mum. Ha! That's a laugh. 
And this is exposition, but it's being thrown at Ian as an insult, so we immediately understand his situation and why he would want to escape it. Ian is a character who is clearly bored with his mundane routine and who seeks excitement by escaping into this conspiracy. These three scenes are linked through the Utopia comic. From the opening sequence, we know that this comic is really important for some reason, probably some kind of conspiracy, as mentioned in Becky's introduction, and from Ian's scene, we know that there's some kind of online community surrounding this thing. We then get our inciting incident in the form of an invitation from one of the forum members, Bejan, who explains to Ian, Becky, and two other members we haven't met yet, Grant and Wilson Wilson, that he is in fact in possession of the second part of the graphic novel that was never published. He invites them to meet up with him, and from the look on his face we can infer that his intention is to share this secret with them, share his burden, and we understand that he knows he's in danger, he's afraid of something. And we understand the stakes of his situation, because we've seen what the people who are looking for this thing are capable of. As it turns out, Grant is actually a child who, on the forums, presents himself as a guy who drives a Porsche and bangs supermodels, which begins to characterise him before we even actually see him, and when we do finally see him and realise that he's a kid, that characterization takes on a different context, and we immediately understand what kind of kid he is. So Grant is from a poor background and probably didn't have the best upbringing as we see him drinking some of his mum's beer and then trying to steal a guy's car. But he's also got another side to him too, which we understand from him placing a blanket over his mother who's passed out on the sofa and recreating drawings from Utopia. Now, after being introduced to most of our protagonists and getting a clear idea of the MacGuffin that will be driving the plot, we shift focus to a character who seems, at first, completely unrelated to these other characters. We meet Michael Dugdale, and the first thing we're introduced to, before even seeing his face, is that he's being blackmailed by someone who's holding his banging a Russian whore against him. And we also see that this blackmailing is leading him to consider suicide. We're then immediately presented with a piece of information that gives greater context to his story. He's married. Hi, hon. Michael, where are you? You okay? Y yeah, 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 I I'm fine. I'm, uh, at work. <laughs> I'll be a little late. You sound a little bit out of kilter. Oh, no, I'm fine, Jen. What the d Department of Health Politics is all... And are you okay about tomorrow? About the clinic? What would you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I have a good feeling this time. This is extremely efficient character writing, and we immediately understand the stakes of this guy's storyline. And even though we don't yet know how it will relate to the other characters, seeing as we then find out that he works in politics, we can gather that he will be involved in the aforementioned conspiracy in some way. And it's only a few minutes later that we find out how he will be involved. For whatever reason, the people blackmailing him want him to push the Department of Health to purchase Russian flu vaccines. But the minister isn't really interested, noting that these purchases aren't always worth the expense, referencing leftover swine flu vaccines, and also commenting on the fact that food prices are rocketing, subtly reminding us once again that this whole food situation is important to the plot in some way. So, in the space of 20 minutes, the episode has pulled the viewer in with its vibrant comic book colour palette, and managed to convey all the necessary information regarding the plot and main characters. It's a tight and perfectly crafted first act, but now we enter the second act, as Ian, Becky and Wilson Wilson meet up at the bar Bejan told them to go to. Unfortunately, Bejan is unable to meet up with them because he's currently being threatened by the two guys from earlier, all of which Grant is witness to as he's broken into his apartment. And as they push Bejan off his balcony, Grant runs away with the manuscript. Meanwhile, we get to spend some quality time getting to know these three characters at the bar as they drink and discuss various conspiracy theories. The scene serves to further characterize these people individually while also setting up the various character dynamics. <laughs> You're actually saying that the tsunami that killed, what, like hundreds of thousands was the American military testing a weapon. <laughs> You're fucking mental, Wilson. It's called a tsunami bomb. A strategically placed nuke on the seabed. Technology's existed since World War II. You're fucking mental, Wilson. Think about it. 
<laughs> if just one of those conspiracy theories is proved, just one. What about Utopia, then? Oh, don't start that Nostradamus crap. Tell him, Becky. Well, I don't believe in as such. But there are some things in it that are a bit odd. What? Wilson Wilson is the full-on conspiracy tard, whereas Ian doesn't really believe in any of that stuff, and Becky lands somewhere in between. Not a conspiracy theorist, but does seem to believe whatever theories are put forward in the Utopia comic. And all of this is just so well written and acted, they feel like actual, real people. And that's a big part of the charm of this series. Plot, the visuals, the music, all that's incredible, but what really binds it all together is the charm and believability of these characters and the way they're brought to life. Who's the little bitch then, son? Does she know you're a bag of puke? Sure does, Dad. After all, I came out of your with the testicles. <laughs> However, after their drunken meetup ends, each member of the group finds themselves involved in some crazy shit that confirms the conspiracy. Wilson Wilson goes to Bejan's place only to find that he apparently killed himself and supposedly had a long history of depression according to his medical records, which Wilson suspects were tampered with. Ian and Becky both get arrested. Ian for raping a minor and Becky for possession of child pornography. Fortunately, they both get out, but this isn't just a crazy coincidence. They had his DNA. So this is the point where Ian is forced to accept the truth of his situation. He can no longer deny the gravity of what's going on here. This shit is real. This is an actual conspiracy. So our characters are pushed into the unknown, into a world where conspiracies are real. And this is also where we find out why Becky got involved in this whole utopia thing in the first place. Last year, I spoke to a nurse who worked at Shenley when Mark Dane was there. The only time he was ever trouble was when they tried to give him a new brand of drug. And he went psycho, like hospitalised three men. The drugs were made by a company called Covat. So? In 2008, a researcher at Berkeley called Norton wrote a paper into a new disease called Deal Syndrome. It's like Huntington's. It's a neurodegenerative disorder where the entire body just shuts down and it, it's, it's hereditary. But what Norton discovered is that Deals has no genetic history whatsoever. It's like it just popped into existence in 1986. Is that possible? No, not really, no. So, so he thought that Deals must have been a man-made disease. So he looked into the patient's backgrounds for a common denominator, nothing, except for one thing. They'd all, at some point, worked for Kovat. Why do you know all this? Fuck. Hang on. So what? If Dane was a geneticist, maybe he, he saw this somewhere, drew it into Utopia? Yeah. Only Utopia was published 1985, and this mutation didn't actually exist until 1989. Utopia part two, there must be something in it that they won. Who the fuck are you? Why'd you know this? Because... my dad had deals. He died of it. Wilson is then interrogated by our two friends over here, who repeatedly ask him... Where... is Jessica Hyde? And after he manages to escape with Ian and Becky, we end the episode with... Hello, I'm Jessica Hyde. The question we've heard repeated multiple times throughout the episode finally gets an answer for the perfect conclusion to a perfect first episode. And there you have it. In one scene, the show established its primary aesthetic concerns, its brilliant tonal balance of violence and humour, and the central MacGuffin that will drive the story. In 20 minutes, it efficiently introduced each of our protagonists' current situations, drives, and the various dramatic stakes, and in one episode, it gives you everything you need to know that you're in for one hell of a ride, and that this is only the beginning. So now that I have your attention, go watch or re-watch the entirety of the series, 
and then join me in part two to see where this intricate tale of morality goes from here.